Good morning, everyone. We have a few more people who are coming in, but I'll just start with a few housekeeping issues before we get going. So in case of an emergency, we will be hearing an alarm sound. Staff here will direct us exactly what to do, but we have a couple of exits and we need to make our way to the Northern Car Park, which is out that way. But if you just pay attention to what staff will be telling us, we will get to there very safely. Now the toilets, you may have seen them as you came in. They're on either side of us. There are also disabled toilets out that way as well. If I could remind you to have your phones on silent, not only so everyone can pay attention to what's going on, but also that will really help our live stream of this event as well. Now I've seen quite a few, quite a few of you wear face masks, which is great. We will need to wear our masks as we're walking around, as we walk in and out of the room as well. We also encourage you to Thanks very much, Emma. Um, on behalf of Brain Injury SA, I would like to welcome everyone, welcome everyone here today and those of you online to the launch of Brain Injury Awareness Week 2021 in South Australia, which is our contribution to the national event that is Brain Injury Awareness Week. Importantly, I would also like to acknowledge this land we meet on today as the traditional lands of the Ghana people and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Greater Adelaide region and their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. This event has become a very important part of the calendar for Brain Injury SA because it is a time to come together to reflect on the impact of brain injury has on people's lives 
how we can continue to learn and further develop what we can do to assist people when brain injury occurs, and also very much how we can celebrate the achievements of those who experience brain injury when they challenge themselves and others to re-embrace their lives. We couldn't event without the support of our sponsors, and I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our presenting partner, Lifetime Support Authority, and our gold sponsor, Duncan Bashir Hannan Lawyers. As an organisation, like everyone, we have continued during the last year to see multiple disruptions, um, but it's been our great staff team that's continued to embrace whatever comes along and stay focused on our mission, which is to enable people to embrace life after brain injury. And for those, we, for those we are here to provide a service to, we thank you and your families for the, your commitment to keep working to fulfil that goal. Sadly, we have seen a few of our participants pass away this year uh, during this journey, and I would like to acknowledge this loss and, and, and the inspiration we drew from working with them. And we offer particularly a warm welcome to their family members who are here today. For this year, Brain Injury Awareness Week, we have included our exhibition, as Emma mentioned, of visual art created by people from the brain injury community. And the visual art includes painting, drawing, sculptures, ceramics, photography, poetry, and textile pieces. And there are so many very talented and creative people in the brain injury community. We're very pleased to be able to showcase their work with you this morning. Engaging in creative activities can be a great way to relax and promote well-being, as well as strengthening self-esteem, exploring non-verbal expression, supporting the development of cognitive abilities, memory, attention, visual processing, and fine motor skills. And I, I think that that saying, it's, it could have come out of an OT handbook, but it's also just fun to make art, and we hope you have fun engaging with our display. And as they say, art is in the, heart, in the eye of the beholder and speak to us in different ways. And today we're inviting you to vote for your favourite piece, and they're very different pieces, so you're going to have a very hard job. But we would, you've been given a voting slip when you came in and registered this morning, so do wander around and have a look and let us know uh, what, you, what your favourite piece is. After this event, a selection of the pieces will be on display at each of Beza's three hubs for the remainder of Brain Injury Awareness Week. And I'd like to thank all those involved in this wonderful art collection for their contribution in being, making it available to us to enjoy today. The theme for Brain Injury Awareness Week this week is breaking through barriers after brain injury. And it's a timely reminder that the barriers that people with brain injury encounter are often those that others erect for them. For us at Beza, it's a daily inspiration to meet with participants who drive themselves through these barriers to achieve multiple goals. These may be both large and small goals that assist in the regaining of independence, engagement in the world of their choice, and generally carving a pathway forward after injury. Our stakeholder survey this year reinforced the importance of growing community education on brain injury, enabling others to avoid creating unnecessary barriers through lack of understanding and knowledge. And this can have an ongoing impact for individuals living with brain injury, going about daily duties, using community facilities, participating in events, engaging in workplaces, anywhere where people may be required to keep justifying or explaining what or why something is difficult when it's not always obvious. If you're here for the first time to learn about brain injury, its impact and how barriers can be broken through, we extend a special welcome for your interest and support and share what you hear today and inspire others to be informed and assist um, the brain injury community through enhanced knowledge. In relation to this, we're also very pleased to share with you an initiative by Brain Injury Tasmania. Today, they are launching the Expression of Interest campaign for their national assistance card. <clears throat> They've trialled this in Tasmania and they are going to be rolling it out nationally. And the national assistance card is personalised and supports cardholders to communicate the impacts of their brain injury or any assistance they require, which takes away necessarily the stigma of having to talk about it all the time. 
And the people will have the option of including a QR code, which we're all getting very familiar with, on their card, which when scanned um, allows the person scanning the card to view additional written or visual information. And we hope this will help with the barrier of communication on the impact of brain injury when people most need it, which can often be at a time of crisis in the community. And we'll be sharing more about this online and ways you can participate in its national rollout. Before I go, I would just like to say a very big thank you to the small dedicated team of BESA staff who've worked to make today happen. You know who you are. The current uncertainties we live in don't make event planning easy, but we are here and it's happening and we thank you for your hard work. We know you're going to enjoy an informative and inspirational morning and thank you on behalf of Brain Injury SA for coming along and being involved wherever you are. Welcome. Thank you, Liz. Up next is our second keynote speaker. Professor Gavin Williams is the Professor of Physiotherapy Rehabilitation, a joint position appointed by Epworth Healthcare and the University of Melbourne. Since he began working at the Epworth Hospital 25 years ago, he's developed a program to teach advanced gait and running skills to people with neurological injuries. He has since become a world leader in the assessment, classification and treatment of mobility limitations following traumatic brain injury. Gavin was awarded fellowship to the Australian College of Physiotherapists in 2011, has more than 130 peer-reviewed journal publications and more than 200 conference presentations so we're in very good hands. And continuing with our Olympic theme, he was also involved in the development of a new classification system for Paralympic athletes, and that was implemented at the London Paralympic Games. Please welcome Professor Gavin Williams. Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's uh, quite an honour. So I'll be speaking about um, some of our research and our clinical programs and um, following on from Amber, we'll also be using some sporting analogies uh, as we go. To put a bit of context to what I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to uh, show some videos that obviously got consent to do um, show these videos from um, some of our patients. So, you know, um, yeah, severe and complex um, brain injury, you know, is very challenging to treat and work out what's going wrong, what exactly do we need to fix, and uh, requires a lot of resource and time and effort. Uh, from everyone's behalf. So this one of our young guys from a few years ago who had run over on the way to school um, and nine months of rehab, this is the first time he's taken steps on his own. Um, and then another nine months later, you can see he's made you know, further progress uh, and you know, he's now back running. And uh, this guy has been knocked off his bike on a training ride, he's a triathlete. Uh, again, he's only just starting to walk on his own after eight months of pretty intense rehab. And then, you know, a couple of years go by and he's just starting to uh, run again. At this point, he can already ride and swim, but you know, running was a thing that he needed to, um, his last goal in terms of getting back to triathlons, which he actually did. Uh, whoops, sorry, let's flick through that too quickly. Uh, one of our uh, young guys run over on the way home from footy training a couple of years ago. Uh, it um, you know, often requires two, three, four of us to get uh, these people up on their feet and uh, walking um, as they wake up from their comas. And then, you know, months uh, of hard work go by and, um, you know, they get running and he's made it back to footy this year, which is great. And then, you know, other young guys. So, you know, just um, the amount of work that goes on, you know, from the clinicians is uh, quite, you know, incredible really, uh, but so is the work from the patient's uh, perspective. Um, and so whether, whether it's, uh, you know, getting back to soccer, triathlons, footy, basketball, in the case of these four young people, uh, you know, participation in, in sport is often a, a goal for many of the younger people we work with. But in terms of the theme of barriers, working in traumatic brain injury is challenging because, uh, you know, Amber mentioned the term evidence-based practice. So 
we aspire to be evidence-based practitioners, but in traumatic brain injury, despite all the work that's done, it t- tends to be in the um, cognitive behavioural psychosocial domains, and there's not a lot of evidence for physiotherapy-type treatments in traumatic brain injury. And so you know, that's in stark contrast to, say, cerebral palsy or stroke. When they developed the Australian Stroke Guidelines uh, in 2018, there was 109,000 pieces of research uh, reviewed uh, and uh, when you don't have evidence in the population you're working with, you tend to look at other populations like stroke or MS or cerebral palsy to see what they're doing and might, what might work for uh, your patients. And that can be problematic because um, people with brain injury are a little bit different. They tend to be younger. They tend to have some scope for recovery. And whether it's uh, um, traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury, um, you know, we've got lots of people, survivors of uh, neuro-oncology and neurosurgery. Um, you know, lots of people have lots of goals that are not just about uh, walking, getting out of hospital. But not only do they face barriers, but, you know, sometimes uh, the barriers we face are the funding models that you know, are biased towards the early phase of rehab and not so much, you know, the community uh, phase and the latter phase of rehab when we're looking at, um, you know, community reintegration and participation. Uh, and then also, you know, Sometimes we just fall into habits and, you know, spend uh, our efforts on that early phase, which is all about, you know, get them up, get them going, get them out, and not really so much that latter focus on, you know, well, what next and, you know, quality of life is often all about, uh, you know, participation. So I'll just talk a little bit about uh, what we do in our journey. So, you know, 20 odd years ago, uh, we were looking at, um, you know, getting people back to running and sport and social leisure activities. Uh, and we work in an outcome-based uh, funding model, which means we can get funding to treat someone as long as we can demonstrate we're effective. But most of the mobility scales used in rehab um, have a ceiling effect, which means they don't measure the amount of physical capacity required uh, to do the things we love doing. So um, this is one of these young guys who uh, scored 87 out of 91 on the on the motor fin. Now the fin is the most widely used outcome measure in the world, and uh, you know when I was at uni, I never scored 87 out of 91 for an exam, and I'm sure if I did, I would have thought I was going pretty well. But this is not, you know, going pretty well for a young adult. Uh, nor is this, you know, 88 out of 91. So we developed the high mat, and this is what it looks like. Uh, just because we needed an outcome measure to measure those more advanced things, you know, running, skipping, hopping, jumping that are required for participation for uh, many of our patients. So this uh, young lady who's um, a severe So uh, that obviously We, we try to focus on that latter stage, that tail end uh, rehab that's required. In relation to traumatic brain injury, which is just one type of acquired brain injury, um, the vast majority of people in Australia who have a traumatic brain injury are, uh, are young adults. So. It's sometimes referred to as a silent epidemic because it's the number one cause of death and disability for uh, 15 to 45 year old um, adults, whereas strokes are you no know, main cause of death and disability for who have uh, some uh, uh, residual disability in their mobility. And so high level mobility might be appropriate uh, for some. And so some remarkable improvement, um, like I just shown, and we measured that recovery with all these outcome measures. And it's really important to measure that recovery and, you know, um, and they're confronted by, you know, every day the things they can't do that they used to be able to do. Uh, and my process, the bigger picture should be about is um, getting back to doing what they love. And that requires, um, you know, higher levels of physical 20 years ago. There was a massive focus on things like spasticity and balance and, you know, that they are important. 
that's now um, well accepted that for most people with adult um, and pediatric neurological conditions, the main problem affecting mobility uh, is muscle weakness. And so, you know, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of work looking at, um, you know, treatments for uh, muscle weakness, so strength training, obviously. Um, there's been, you know, dozens and dozens of trials, so much science. You know, these are the stroke guidelines for Australia and the US. Um, but in terms of doing strength trainers, use the sporting analogy, we have to be really, really specific in what we do. Because we can't use this one size fits all and just do generic strength training because, uh, well, it doesn't work. Uh, but luckily, we've got the American College of Sports uh, Medicine guidelines that talks about task specificity and uh, how we should go about what we're doing. And it's basically, we treat um, our patients the way you train an athlete. It's the bottom line. And in many regards, uh, our role is to um, act like the coach or the trainer. Okay. And so, you know, that role includes working out what is, you know, I'm not going to boil all these details, but, you know, what is the role of the muscle? What type of contraction does it um, elicit? You know, how quickly uh, does it contract and through what range and what other muscle groups uh, do we need to there's a lot to it, but we need to be very specific in what we do. And the reason why we need to be really specific is because if you consider someone like Hussein or Cadell or James, you know, someone, you know, these people have all been the best in the world at their chosen sports, they're all going to benefit from having stronger legs. And if you were their strength and conditioning coach, there's no way in the world you'd give them the same exercises because they've got very different outcomes they're trying to achieve, just like our patients have a wide variety of different outcomes they're trying to achieve. But the reason why it's very important to be specific is because the body will change. It's um, you know, Norman Doig's book that Amber uh, mentioned. It's uh, the body will change if it's uh, consistently and systematically um, stressed. So if you look at Roger here, he's got one forearm that's twice the size of the other. You know, it's a result of training. He wasn't born like that. Uh, the gymnasts have, you know, incredibly muscular upper bodies and it's not like they do get in the gym and do traditional weight training. Um, it's a result of, you know, the gymnastic training they're doing. Uh, the German sprint cyclists on the bottom left, they got deformed the legs. And again, they're not born like that. It's a result of training. Or uh, Dave Weir, who won nearly every track event in the uh, London Paralympics. Uh, bodies will change if you um, very consistently and systematically and specifically stress them. So to give an example here of... Um, uh, this is uh, Matt Graham, who you're know, probably not familiar with, but if you watch him train and think... Uh, this is one of our young girls from uh, two years ago who had a terrible uh, horse riding accident uh, in the same month that we lost three female jockeys and equestrian events. Okay, so uh, it took us a while to get her walking, but her goal, um, or her only goal really, was to get her apprentice uh, license back. Um, and so when we uh, look at the cadence of the horse, we works out that this is the position she needs to be in. groups, what do they do, what are their actions, what should we prioritise for treatment, how do we come up with the most effective exercises uh, and uh, identify, you know, what are the biomechanics and how do we best match those um, requirements with exercise and, and smarter exercise prescription. So how does all this work and, you know, what do we actually do in the clinic? So um, if we use walking or running as an example, um, because that's you know, a very common goal, uh, and running uses basically the same muscles in a very similar way to what walking does, three main things that determine how fast you walk or run. So the, the first thing is uh, the hip extensors or your glutes. So when your foot first hits the ground, they are, uh, act very powerful. The other thing at the hip is the hip flexors, the groin muscles that um, help you swing your leg forward. One of the interesting things is that despite having, you know, um, quad, uh, quadriceps, so thigh muscles uh, that are the strongest muscles in uh, in your body, they actually don't do much when you walk. 
And their main role in walking is to absorb power, not to generate power. And the other muscle in your thigh, at the back of your leg, are your hamstrings. And again, they don't generate uh, force for walking, they absorb force. And a better understanding of biomechanics would help you know, a lot of our clinicians uh, pres uh, prescribe more effective exercises. But the single most important thing uh, that drives the way we walk is your calf muscle. And can they act very quickly and very powerfully uh, as we put off uh, to accelerate your body forward. So if you appreciate uh, you know, this sort of not quite basic understanding uh, of uh, the way we move and then apply that and, and think about how we're going to prescribe exercises, this is the angle when we walk and uh, across a range of different speeds. And so when you see a steep gradient on a graph, that means, uh, you know, that joints is moving quickly. And we can look at that and go, okay, if someone's walking slowly, this is how much range the ankle has to walk uh, work through. But if they start to walk faster, then they have to move their ankle a lot more and they have to use, uh, move their ankle a lot more quickly. And speed is crucial to many of the things that uh, we need to achieve in rehab because a lot of our patients just move slowly. Uh, we can also look at other aspects of uh, kinetics to help work out uh, forces and powers that we need to uh, train. So in relation to strength training over the last 20 years, uh, it might be surprising for me to then go on and say, even though it's in all these guidelines, that it's largely failed, okay? So we know it's safe and effective um, for many people with different neurological conditions. And a lot of people have got stronger, which is fantastic. The reason I say it's failed is that it hasn't translated into improved ability to walk uh, or run or uh, do other functional things. So these references here, these seven systematic reviews, have all looked at um, different populations and basically found that despite making people stronger, uh, people aren't walking any faster. Uh, and that's pretty weird if weakness is the main problem. So something's clearly going wrong um, and why are people not getting better? So we decided we'd do our own systematic review, not because we wanted to be number eight, uh, but because we wanted to work out what was going wrong. So we also looked at all these trials that were done uh, with people um, with various different neurological conditions uh, to work out what was going wrong. And so instead of working out whether, you know, is it effective or not, because we knew that it wasn't having the effect that we uh, desired, we looked at what were they actually doing and so this graph just looks at what the exercises were that were prescribed in all these different uh, trials. And what we found was the most commonly prescribed exercises were the muscles uh, acting on your thigh, so your quads and hammies. Um, and these yellow, uh, green bars here are the ones um, that are most important for walking. So basically what's happened over the last 20 years is that they've targeted the wrong muscles um, in the wrong position and at the wrong speed. And that's, you know, the reason why it hasn't translated. So it's not an absence of effect in that it does work. Um, it's an absence of translation that it, the gains are not translating into improved function. Uh, and that's really what we, you know, what our patients want is to function better. So, you know, we can look at the biomechanics and this is the hip, knee and ankle. And then, you know, specifically here at the ankle, you know, this highlights how important speed is uh, in the exercises we prescribe. And typically what happens in most of these trials is they're doing slow, traditional strength training. And what we need to be doing is fast strength training. Um, and strength training isn't necessarily that complicated. You know, it's weights, reps and sets. You know, my nana can do that sort of thing. Uh, it's about being very, very specific because, you know, we need to treat our patients like you would um, train an athlete. And, you know, it might take a long time as those videos showed, but, you know, for some people it's possible. So I mentioned just uh, previously that the calf muscle is the single most important muscle group uh, for power generation when we walk. And so, you know, you'd expect uh, that a lot of studies should focus on power generation. And just to be clear, uh, for those people who are unsure, strength is about how much force you can generate. Whereas power is not about how much force, but how quickly you can generate the force. And that's what's crucial for us. Um, for walking, for example, because you don't use your ma maximum strength every step. You know, you just use a sub-threshold amount of your strength to walk every step. So it's not how necessary how strong you are, but how quickly can you use the strength that you've got. So this graph, it's an old one, and it just looks at, you know, how strength is generated, or force is generated, I should say, and what happens with training. So we know that if you do heavy strength training, you are going to become a lot stronger, okay? And that's great, but that's not necessarily the outcome we're trying to achieve. We're trying to uh, achieve uh, improved function. And so if 
we give people fast strength training because that's what they need to in order to function. What we're trying to do is not change the end point, uh, but the shape of the curve. Okay, so get them to generate more force more quickly. And this vertical red line here just shows where um, how much time you've got to push off when you walk. So you don't have that much time. And so even if you do heavy uh, strength training, uh, you don't have more force available to your push off. So we need to focus on doing some faster strength training. And that has traditionally not happened uh, uh, much in the literature. Most of the studies have focused on uh, heavy, slow strength training. And so that's why we're not getting improved outcomes for our patients. So what does this look like? So up the top here, we've got um, a seated leg press. And, um, you know, this is a very, very common exercise. So at the top left, this shows, you know, if someone would be pushing in and out. Uh, and what we would suggest they should be doing is pushing, uh, you know, in and out more quickly uh, to the point where they would jump. Okay, so you're trying to generate as much force as quickly as possible. And then the bottom left, you know, graph is on the leg sled, just someone be going uh, up and down, you know, as you, as you, you know, you conventionally would. Or alternatively, you can um, go up and down, you know, with a hop or a jump. And we can just grade the difficulty of that by changing the inclination of the sled. So most of the work to date has been done on strength or force training with very, very little on uh, fast strength training. We also call it ballistic training or power training. Um, and so, you know, this is a great idea potentially, but does it work? Um, so one of our students did a systematic review last year. So I looked at all the studies that were done um, on fast strength training and found that it was safe and feasible for a whole lot of different people. Okay. But the pub, most of the studies, and there weren't a lot of them, but they've all been published in the last few years. Um, so it's a really new and emerging uh, field. So it's nice to know that it's safe and feasible. Obviously, that's a very important box to tick, but, you know, does it work? So uh, my colleague, um, Anthony Shack and I, we were looking at uh, brain injury outcomes over six months. So we took people into the gate lab where you saw some of those videos and measured their walk, and then we measured again six months later because all the evidence um, in stroke and other populations like cerebral palsy showed that people improve their walking speed by compensating. That's what all the evidence was about. You know, despite all this wonderful stuff about neuroplasticity, people recover via uh, compensation. And what we wanted to look at is that during rehab, uh, do our patients improve their walking and get faster because they can become better at compensating or because they actually normalize the way they work. So to cut a long story short, um, this was ankle power generation for the people with traumatic brain injury because this is the most important uh, aspect of walking. And this is the same people six months later uh, with brain injury. And you can see it's you know basically no different to the healthy control comparison group we had. So this was the first evidence in any adult or pediatric neurological population that we can actually normalize the way people move. And the other good aspect of this um, was this graph that shows that as people improve what's normal in terms of the way they move, then they also concurrently stop compensating. Uh, okay, and so then um, we put packaged all this information together, this framework, it's theory of matching biomechanics with exercise prescription and um, published uh, that a couple of years ago. Um, and we have a large multi-center trial in um, Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide, uh, looking at the effectiveness of doing this in traumatic brain injury we've just finished uh, recruiting for and we'll have the results later in the year uh, and uh, another PhD student of ours um, Jen did the same thing in a pilot RCT in stroke and yeah, it was only a pilot RCT of 30 people but it was the most effective um, uh, intervention for stroke for walking so you know that's exciting but we need to uh, now get funding for a larger uh, scale uh, project of 180 people which is um, what we're applying for. But, you know, optimising outcomes and breaking through barriers and all that is, you know, not just about the therapy um, and treatment. Uh, it's not just about walking or running that I've talked about. It's basically about participation. Uh, and that is challenging when often, you know, we don't all have the skills to achieve the goals that our patients require. So, you know, we need to rely on skilled colleagues um, uh, in other domains for, you know, true social, leisure, sporting, um, employment integration. Uh, and just to finish with a few.
uh, is not particularly great. Uh, but the thing is, people can often do amazing things when given the opportunity. You know, he loved riding. That, that was you know, he had two passions, riding and lawn bowls. And he went through our bike program and just was not quite. even though it's abnormal, you know, enabled him to uh, get back to uh, uh, skiing, which is, you know, key goal for him and his. We definitely need better evidence for therapy, you know, to improve our patient's outcome, uh, it goes without saying. And, you know, patient-centred care and stuff is a term that gets thrown around a bit, but uh, it's quite overused. But really, this is what to achieve participation, and we might need to, you know, form better links with Disabled Winter Sports Victoria or Disability Sport and Rec or the Paralympic um, model and, you know, work out what people want to do and how do we best in always, um, uh, you know, the patient's uh, brain injury that's limiting their capacity to uh, participate. Sometimes it's uh, the funding uh, models. Thank you very much. Williams for sharing. topic that's not very often discussed and from our point of view is a very important topic to be discussed. So we'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for inviting us to be part of this and to speak with you today as well. I'd also like to take a chance particularly to say hello to those online. Unfortunately with COVID we haven't been able to have very large present groups of people in one room but today is a different I guess. But quite frankly even if we had a room that was full day, because it's really interesting from my point of view, the things you were talking about earlier on are the things I hear my clients talk about all the time when they come in to see me. Um, but it was actually great to have a bit of a positive message to actually pass on to them when we actually talk to them. So it was really good to hear that today. And don't be surprised if I steal those five points and start talking to my clients about those in the near future. Um, I 
got a couple of quick slides I'd like to run through of you all, um, mostly because we advertise as we always do at these sort of events, but also a bit of key messaging from a point of view of a lawyer talking to someone that might... And from my point of view, I think what's really important to actually talk about is not necessarily what we can do for you, but really a message is from my point of view about us actually being there to work with you for whatever problem you do have. Because at the end of the day, you need to be comfortable with whoever you've actually engaged with to actually represent you. It's all well and good to hear any firm, whether it's my firm or another firm, talk about the fact that for you and give, trying to get the best outcome for you. And I guess the flip side of that is from never alone having to actually deal with lawyers and legal systems etc. So the one thing I'd like to leave as a message for you to Other people may have different views. Um, we have this lovely new ad that we just developed the other day, which is a bit about Lawyers.
for it themselves if they're not able to. So that might be in relation to accommodation, health and lifestyle needs. Thank you for having us and um, we're very privileged to be part of this uh, very important week. Um, thank you. Thank you to our gold sponsor, DBH Lawyers. Well, we now have a short pre-recorded presentation from Dr. Jenna Zebel, who's a lecturer in the Wicking Dementia Research and Education Centre at the University of Tasmania. Her research focuses on the role of inflammation, in particular, the function of the brain's immune cells in health, ageing and disease. Now, the brain's immune cells are called microglia. Jenna is an emerging leader in the field of TBI, and she's uncovered how the shapes of microglia change with ageing and disease. Her current research looks at whether the microglial response following TBI is different in males and females. And as you'll see in her video, she'll also take us through a free online course called Understanding Traumatic Brain Injury, which is offered by the Wicking Dementia Research and Education Centre. Let's watch her presentation now. Hi, I'm Jenna, and I am here today to give a brief overview of the Understanding Traumatic Brain Injury Massive Open Online Course, also known as the Understanding TBI MOOC. I'd like to start by thanking the organisers of the Brain Injury SA Brain Awareness Week, Brain Injury Awareness Week uh, for the invitation to talk with you today. The Understanding TBI MOOC is really an initiative that was starting who had realised that there is quite a hole in the um, information available to not only people who have sustained a brain injury, but millions of people are affected by traumatic brain injury every year. Um, as some estimates are about 69 million people worldwide each year. And we think that this is actually an underrepresentation of the total number of people that um, sustain injury because concussions are often where you are within um, Australia. The, the support staff um, mightn't be within your community and rather you might need to travel great distances. So we thought by uh, setting up this MOOC, we might be able to a mission TBI is really to start, um, it's a, entity of money that we calls for grants to start um, really helping um, raise awareness um, and improve outcomes. A free fully online course um, that we have developed to be approximately two hours worth of content per week for about five weeks. It's aimed at anyone who wants to learn more about traumatic brain injury. So although you might um, um, supplementary or um, revision for you about what, um, what happens to individuals with a brain injury. So our this, uh, the first iteration or the first version of our TBI MOOC went live in June 2021. Um, people join us from New Zealand and Canada um, and India had about 970 enrollees. So it really has gone across the world um, and it's had a great uptake. So the course is split into four modules, wired brain injuries. We also talk about um, the brain structure and function um, so that you can understand that depending on where your injury is you might have different symptoms to another person with brain injury traumatic brain injury we all have whereas the secondary injury cascades uh, are initiated at that point but then they progress for days weeks or months after the initial injury in module two we really start diving into the how traumatic brain injury is a spectrum and it can be from mild so those concussion injuries all the way to severe injury um, and concussion are and we make sure that we really integrate into there that concussions are not just a sporting injury that you can get concussion from other means such as um, motor vehicle accidents as well as falls we also talk about moderate to severe injury where often that there's a focal contusion or bruise to the brain and then we dive deeper into what happens in the primary damage in the focal TBI, those biochemical processes that are initiated by the impact and what happens to the brain in the days to weeks after that injury. We talk about diffuse traumatic brain injury, so the injury that happens globally to the brain rather than specific um, discrete regions. 
We talk about brain swelling, also known as edema, and we have um, content about imaging for diagnosis and prognosis as well. In module two, we also start diving into linking that um, brain injury to cognition and behaviour. So really depending on where your injury is, the symptoms that might be there. Start to talk about traumatic brain injury across the lifespan. So what happens to paediatric um, patients versus um, and how they age with their injury compared to say those um, 18 to 24 year olds and the older population. We talk a little bit about the chronic traumatic encephalopathy or those diseases that might eventuate after injury, um, as well as consequences of brain, traumatic brain injury that aren't within the brain. Um, we know from research that's starting to come out that there can be effects on the lung and the uh, musculoskeletal system, as well as the gut. We often talk about the gut as being the second brain, and we do know, and there's a lot of research starting to come out, that there can be changes to the way your gut functions following injury. And then the last module, we really talk about life after traumatic brain injury, impairments in outcomes, different rehabilitation strategies. Uh, we talk a little bit about life for the family members, uh, as well as support. Uh, there's also um, information about uh, coping style and resilience and finding information that's reliable. So throughout um, the Traumatic Brain Injury MOOC, you will find information is presented in a variety of ways. We'll have um, conversational style videos, such as this one here of myself and Nicole Bai. Um, we take a visit to the path lab and we use some plastic models to really illustrate where the brain um, structure is and then what its function or what it does. We have over-the-shoulder graphics and some face-to-camera um, segments to really explain, um, explain those complicated um, processes that may occur in um, the days to weeks after the initial injury. And we also have um, some little interactive games embedded within the MOOC so that you can really hone your skills on understanding brain structure and function. Um, we've also embedded what we call personal perspectives, which are short videos um, from people living with a brain injury. And I'm just... So these personal perspective videos also include some um, information from the uh, family members as well. dementia so please check them out if you have time
of brain injury. in the gantry three times a week for three or four weeks. The one month I could toilet shower and shave myself uh, okay when i when i left hospital and there's one here again after several months i could walk again a sorry a it's not a with 
a stick and I and I lived with my friend John about two months. I went to Flinders Flinders and swimmed and physioed for no this one is sorry every every week i have really really good family and friends to help me it no it's not it they are very important for not for to have get get better getting better what are some of the barriers you have had to overcome i have worked on physical barriers mainly my right arm and leg i want to get better no get no back to riding a mountain bike this is a real big goal for me i have learned to walk again and now sorry i am oh, this one again now eh? going to ride again did you have any issues or barriers with your memory when you first woke up okay so when i when i first had a stroke i was frustrating i could not use a computer or phone i could not remember anything like passwords i have fixed those problems and now i can remember passwords and logins now i use my computer sorry my phone and our ipad for everything i you i use whatsapp and catch up with my indonesian family a couple of times a day i talk to my my daughters and my friends in adelaide using messenger my speech is getting better which i am <laughs> i do a lot of practice and improve my speech and communication what are you up to now in your life okay i have speech and physiotherapy with brain injury sa four times a week i also no i have recently got a new leg brace and now is now walking much better i walk now about 30 minutes 
every day. I have recently started walking without, is that right? Without my, my stick for the first time. I do the home, sorry, home exercise and stretch and strengthen my arm and leg and core muscles. I use I work around is So a little bit about Sue. She retired in March 2019 and a few months later, she was doing what many of us dream about in retirement. She was enjoying a holiday. But it was on that holiday in far North Queensland when she had a stroke. Now she'll explain some of this shortly, but she had quite the journey to get help and treatment before she was finally brought home to start her recovery. And she completed rehab with Flint and the Brain Injury Rehabilitation Community and Home Program known as Birch, which we've talked briefly about today. Please make her welcome. Thank you. No? Yeah, I think that's yeah. on. Yeah. Yep.
we were not discharged from Cairns Hospital and then I So what sort of changes and challenges did you notice after your injury? I need to read because um, so some of the changes are my short... Um, sorry, yeah. So I was told that the stroke uh, was on my left hand side of my brain and then that would be, be affecting my right hand side of my brain. Um, well, my right hand side and also my speech and language and I was t later told that, that this was called aphasia and I have aphasia of my speech. Yeah. So um, I had no words at all from following my stroke and then I gradually learnt how um, to um, speak and this is what is me today and but my body feels like it's split, split in two my body body and the sensations I feel quite different on my right and my left side of my body, right down to my, that I can't really um, think very quickly. And I've got um, short term memory, memory, mm -hmm, sorry, memory loss, and um, my words don't always come out very well, and that is so frustrating. And frustrating. So I can to my right and and oh about that I can also with my voice one of the thought. Um, I uh, to see in to get to go home. I can yep and um apology helping me to accept that I didn't ask stroke um, but I need to adapt to me, and that is very much a work in and um, maybe um, don't realize 
that you need to adapt to the new normal. So, yeah. So what are some of the barriers that you've encountered as a result of your back brain injury? Okay. So, um, obviously I can't process my thoughts very quickly and this sometimes, or often, leads to my speech be, being quite wooden and, um, and forced and people just need to give me extra time to get my words out. Um, this year has been a good day, yeah. So, um, and some people also um, think that I have a, got a intellect, uh, um, in, an intellect, um, no, Sorry. disability. Yeah, but that I have not got an intellect disability at all. Um, all of my intellect is. Fine, fine. Yeah. So um, some of the physical barriers are thing like things, um, silly things uh, that I go to put my finger into the lock on the door to turn the key, but my finger is not a key. I can't turn <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, buttering my. Um, my toast with my finger. <laughs> the fingers in the butter or the Vegemite, so that doesn't work. The iron does not belong in the fridge. <laughs> Last time I looked, yeah. So, but I, and also, um, I do dangerous things. So, um, uh, I have been known to pick up a, um, a pot from the, stove with um, no mitts, oven mitts, and that's really dangerous, and I know that, um, but the thought processes just don't work sometimes. Um, I flip an egg with my finger, not a, uh, not a egg flip, so yeah. So uh, it's a bit of a problem, and I think people don't, mostly don't think I have problems with my uh, mobility, but I do, so, yeah. So how do you work to overcome all those barriers and mm. to not do those things, like picking up things yeah. without the other mix? Yeah, <laughs> so, so around my house, uh, around my um, kitchen in particular, particular um, I have signs um, saying, um, look down, look down, and they are triggering, tr triggering my memory to look down and think, oh, um, there is an egg, egg flip for turning the egg over, or oh, um, they, there is also a um, oven, uh, oven mitt. So um, that is the main things I have lists of um, what I, what I, no, no, sorry, uh, I, um, I have lists of what I want to do, so I can't rely on my memory, clearly. Um, what, I have mobility rails to help me um, be, um, safer around the home and importantly I have um, two uh, support groups that I go to um, called Talk Back uh, Aphasia SA and Families for Families and um, they are helping me to just be me and uh, accept who I am and the difficulties uh, that I have now and I am, admire 
all these people because they are just, just struggling to learn how to live with their disability. And I don't like using that right word, so yeah. So what are you up to now and what are your plans for the future? Yeah. Okay, so um, my speech and therapies and psych are continuing, so that's good. Um, I would like to expand my repertoire of songs to sing to um, Riley and Carter and Blake because probably they are getting sick of the same old songs. <laughs> I am, so yep, yeah, so watch out family. <laughs> um, my husband will be, Theo will be retiring in the next year. We have already got a caravan but we are now going a four-wheel drive and I'm, we, we are going to um, go back to far north Queensland and finish the German journey that we were so rudely interrupted <laughs> by. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. And our caravan is going to be named Unfinished Business. <laughs> yeah. And so... So you've mentioned your family before and the support group, yeah. Families for Families. Yeah. How important have they been in your progress and rehabilitation? Oh, oh um, massively so. Um, the so support groups, um, yeah, oh, they, they are really um, good. They are, um, we swap stories and we um, also can see, uh, get information about um, other resources uh, for me, but um, my, um, my greatest motivation Huge thank you to Sue and her husband. I'd now like to invite David Lee and his wife Sunny onto the stage to join me. <laughs> Surgeries due to recurrence of tumours. He's been attending therapy sessions at Brain Injury SA since May last year, after previously completing the out outpatient rehab program offered by Bird. And he wants to be involved
about your brain injury? How did you sustain that? Uh, my my life changing moment was uh, I was having lunch the day before Christmas Eve, uh, two thousand eight. I had a grand mal seizure, and initially I was in denial as I was strong and fit and healthy at the time, and um, scans indicated. I had a brain tumor and um, I was uncertain of the future and so they said I would have to operate as soon as possible. So I just married Sunny three days before the first brain injury, in, injury surgery in January 2009. So you said you were you know, physically fit and healthy, you were doing a heap of stuff outdoors. Just tell me a bit about that before we talk about the challenges then. I was into a lot of canyoning, rock climbing, bike riding. Like uh, I'd, I'd go do Everest base camp walks by myself, self-guided tours. I'd, I'd, um, what else would I do? I'd like old cars. Um, I'd, I'd be driving racing cars, and these are old, uh, old uh, speedway cars. Anything I'd be involved in. So your life obviously changed dramatically when you found out that you had this, uh, this tumour and the brain cancer. So what sort of changes and challenges did you notice after your injury and, and how hard has it been to adjust to life because obviously things have changed a lot for you? Well, when I woke up from my first surgery, I was paralysed and I had to relearn to walk again and uh, there's always a, some weakness down the left-hand side and there was sensitivity issues down the left-hand side and um, I had poor balance and there was always fatigue to deal with and I had short-term memory losses like a lot of other people here. And it was difficult for me to disclose that this uh, cancer diagnosis with all my families and friends because I was previously a, a, an adrenaline junkie from a long time ago. And so every time, so you had a few brain surgeries, didn't you? Did you have to relearn everything each time you had that surgery? So pretty much I had to relearn to walk like four times. So. So that's all a challenge. You have to start from scratch every time. So how did that therapy work for you? What sort of therapies and, and treatments and assistance did you have? Um, every time I went to assistance, I went to... Um, I was lucky I had a lot of assistance from um, a good allied health professionals from the General Pat Flinders Medical Centre. And lucky for the last one, I had Birch, the Birch program in Hampstead as well as the General Repat where they moved to now. And I have to be grateful for Charlie Teo, his skills and his optimism for my last two brain surgeries. And my friends, and especially Sunny, and we've been through a lot together because it hasn't been easy. So thank you, Sunny. And, yeah. So what are some of the barriers that you've encountered as a result of your brain injury? I think a lot of the, the barriers is I can no longer push the barriers like I used to be able to do. So I have to set myself mini goals. So it'd be like walking without a stick and like I, I wouldn't take the easy route. I'd, instead of walking up the ramp, I might take a big step. We all noticed that one. <laughs> and I'd, I'd try to eat healthier. So eat less sugar, do, uh, not, not drink any alcohol, eat less meat and surround myself with positive people. Um, I'd, 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 my other hobbies I'd, I'd take is uh, mushroom picking, and it's because I, I really like the outdoors, so that's my, always my way of de-stressing, is go outdoors and I try not to dwell on what I couldn't, can't do anymore. And so I, I take up mindfulness as well to, to stop worrying and I never give up. How difficult has it been to adjust to that um, mindset? Because obviously you, you, your mind was you know, all about the adrenaline and going outdoors and doing all those sorts of things and then having to, to shift. That must have been really hard for it you. It has been. So one of my favourite sayings is carpe diem. It's uh, never give up, live for the day. That's one of the ones I really enjoy. And so what are you up to these days? And, and what are your plans for the future? Well, these days I'm full-time work and I've, I'm back to riding to work. So I've um, built, put, I put an electric motor on my bike, so I've made an e-bike so I can um, ride to work but manage my fatigue and I've tried to get back into regular bushwalking to make sure I spend a lot of time outdoors. But in the future, when the borders open up again, I hopefully can get into some overnight walk, walks near Cradle Mountain. One I've always done is one called Walls of Jerusalem and maybe in New Zealand when the borders open up. And we've talked a lot about family and support network. What's uh, your support network like? Uh, well, I have to thank Sunny. She's really been mostly helpful. 
Uh, and my friends. <laughs> and who is Sunny? I just help a little bit. I try to compensate the other side of his brain. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a long practice, <laughs> hopefully. And um, people did say we meet a lot of uh, people with brain injury, and especially in the younger age and young adults, a lot of people. Um, they actually they lose the previous connection with friends, and especially some people with extreme uh, outdoor activity or extreme activities. And I need to appreciate all this time, and David still with the, um, keep connected with his uh, old climbing mates. A lot of them be really supportive and really uh, look out for him, and uh, so wouldn't be discriminated as to what he not capable to do these days. Yeah, I need to friends, uh, uh, thank a lot of people. And the brain injury essay is that David just started with the speech and the psychological help. And I think that's just a lot of maybe just as a family position. Um, I think for male and female, maybe sometimes the mind process a little bit different. And I think uh, look after physical health and also need to look after your mental health as well. Yeah. Thanks, Sunny. And uh, one, one of the things I always go by is one of, this is one of my friends uh, jumping in the Grampians, but the, one of the sayings I remember is, come to the edge, he said, we can't, we're afraid. They responded, come to the edge, he said, they, they can't, they like, what they, can you read that? We can't, we will fall. They came to the edge and they flew. It says a lot about your adrenaline junkie, I think. <laughs> A huge thank you to our other special guest today. Another big step down there. A very big thank you to David, to Brian Sue for sharing all your stories today. Really powerful and fantastic examples of breaking through barriers after ABI. Well, we're very grateful for the support of the Lifetime Support Authority partner. I'd like to welcome to the stage Rick Howe, CEO of the Lifetime Support Authority, to present Brain Injury Essays Embrace Life After Brain Injury Award. Thank you, and um, good morning, everybody. Although I believe we're just pushing the edge of morning now. The Lifetime Support Authority manages the Lifetime Support Scheme to provide care and support for people who sustain serious injuries in motor vehicle accidents in South Australia, regardless of fault. Um, we've been running since 2014. Around 70% of the people that are accepted into the scheme have a brain injury as a result of their motor vehicle accident. So we work closely with the participants to support their recovery and maximise their independence in the community. Now today, at the official launch of Brain Injury Awareness Week, I have the honour of announcing the winner of the Embrace Life After Brain Injury Award. The award selection committee received many worthy nominations for the award and were inspired by the stories of so many great achievements. It made the committee's final decision really quite difficult. But the winner of the Embrace Life After Injury Award is a person who's demonstrated enormous courage, determination and resilience through some extremely challenging circumstances. This person acquired a brain injury at the age of 17 following a vicious assault that she was lucky to survive. Defying the expectations of doctors, they returned home to live with her family where she worked hard on rehabilitation and adjusted to a new life. With the ongoing support from her devoted family, she continues to make progress some 30 years after her injury. Her most recent goal was to live independently of her family and this was achieved last year with a move into supported accommodation. And with the support and encouragement of her family and staff from Arana, together they've created a beautiful home and garden for her. She's maintained a positive attitude 
and embraced her new environment despite the inevitable anxiety that comes with such a significant life change. She continues to achieve goals and recently attended Club Slick, a dance event where she got to meet new people and make new friends. The selection panel was impressed with her continued determination and positivity after 30 years of living with a brain injury and by the power of her whole support team pulling in the same direction to ensure she meets her goals. So I'm very pleased to announce the winner of this year's Embrace Life After Brain Injury Award is June Wright. Congratulations, June. I'd like to invite June and her parents up to the stage.